back. Hi. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Knock Knock High. I almost said Knock Knock I. Knock Knock High <laughs> with the Glockenflecke. Maybe it's wishful thinking. Mm. Like I, I wish You'd I could be talking be about talking eyeballs, eyeballs right than now. here with me. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to Knock Knock nice. High with the Glockenfleckens. <laughs> I am Dr. Glockenflecken. I am Lady Glockenflecken. Will and Kristen Flannery. That's and right. we this are. This is Glock Talk. This is Glock Talk. I did forget that that we had we had named it that yes. last time. These ones where it's just the two of us. Yeah. Talking about Glock stuff. Talk. Glock talking Glock to Glock. That's what yes. we're doing. And um, before we get into some exciting things we have uh, planned for this episode, mm. uh, we had a case of identity theft. We did. Yes. <laughs> Sadly, it's, it's true. It's a funny case of identity. It's yes. not what, classically what you think of it. Like our our credit scores are okay. Right, right, right. Uh, bank accounts, mm, yeah, are non infiltrated and yeah, Social they're security secured. numbers. Exactly, fine. all that's fine. But uh, why don't you tell the story? Okay, so we have one of our daughters, our younger daughter. She's um, she's got a lot of uh, initiative. You know, she's a make oh, it yes. happen kind of girl, which I can. I can appreciate. It's a good quality to have. It is, yeah. Uh, but sh- for her, no is just sort of a, a suggestion. You know, maybe maybe kind of a just someone's opinion. <laughs> and so she it likes doesn't to figure out a way to make it a yes. Yeah, she doesn't. It doesn't deter her. Uh-huh. It just uh, causes her to select another path toward <laughs> her goal. So you know, it's an admirable quality. This is um, our youngest, by the way. When they are yes. an adult, right. but uh, as a parent, it can be somewhat challenging, right? Because there's times where no is very important. We need them to, yes. you know. So, so it's always this ongoing thing. And now that she's getting older, she's getting even more, you know, clever about it. Um, so you know, we it's been basketball season here. And by the end of a season, anytime we sign this child up for organized sports, she's all about it at the beginning. Then she kind of loses steam yeah. towards, you know, the middle, towards the end. And then, you know, by the end of it, she's just like, I am done with this. Done. I don't want to go anymore. I just can't do this anymore. To be fair to her, basketball season in our town is forever. Is <laughs> quite long. And she is. It's like three she was weeks eight years too old long. This like, season, yeah, so she's eight years old, and she really enjoyed it, and she's pretty good at it. But uh, yeah, yeah, she's it was just, just too long. It was like like me doing uh, a one of my rotations. We'll say like psychiatry rotation in med school. I thought it was very interesting at first. By the mm-hmm. end of it, I was like, like "Let okay, me do I've, I've something else. Can I please do that?" And every right. every residency rotation was the same way. That's why I became a comprehensive ophthalmologist because right. at the end of glaucoma, I was like, please, no more glaucoma. Right. You want no a variety more. of things. So anyway, I get it. I get yeah, it. Yeah. She's like that. Uh, and so, you know, since the last few weeks, she'd been begging us like, oh, do I have to go? I don't want to go. All these mm. things. Okay. And of course, we always say, yes, you have to go. You made a commitment. That's how this works. Your team members are depending on you. No, you know, nobody gets to sit out if there's only five kids there. And that's not nice. So, you know, that wasn't working. She was running up against resistance and just asking not to go. And so she took it upon herself Mm -hmm. uh, to pretend to be me by texting you. Yes. So she, I mean. This was in the middle of my clinic. I was at at work, work. Which she knows you're distracted. Yes. So by the way, this was actually this is a Saturday. Yeah. So this you is had before a Saturday her game. clinic. That's why right. she was able to do this because if she was at school, obviously she wouldn't be able to do this. Right. But yeah. this is Saturday. I had a Saturday Believe clinic. Believe it or I not, was, he does work some I was Saturdays. On, I was on call. And when I'm on call, I do a Saturday clinic. That's right. In the morning. She had a game that afternoon. So she texts you while you're at work. And she says, Will. And she's texting from an iPad, which is obviously a different number than my phone. So she goes, Will. I can't find my phone, but I need to tell you. These are all separate texts. Yeah. Will text. I looked at this immediately I and I was like, this phone. is not how I text. I, this is not my style. I can't find my phone. Send. Right. But I need to tell you. Send. send. She says, Will, I can't find my phone, but I need to tell you. She puts her name. Is tired. Her cold is getting worse. Her toenail got chipped off also. <laughs> And then, and then he bought it. I, well, okay. So I'm like in the middle of like a busy Saturday morning clinic. So I just like, I, I see this and looking back, I'm like, okay, clearly like this, these are weird texts. Like it's not the way Kristen t- typically texts, but I responded. I said, did she tell you she doesn't want to play? 
because I assumed that this was about the basketball because she'd been complaining about basketball right, right. lately. So she put, well, she doesn't want to play, but she feels bad. And then, and then I said, well, she was running everywhere last night because she was fine last there was night. like a, 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 a school function. She was with her friends. They were just going crazy running around. Right. And then here's the kicker. She goes, I don't know if she should go or not, but it's up to you. This is the child. She's eight years old. Yeah. yeah. Just like passing it off to you. But I don't know. You know, you make the final decision. <laughs> but here's some information. I and I so I, I totally bought it. I yeah. totally bought it. And uh, um, and so we got home. It turns out I had no idea this was happening. <laughs> meanwhile, I had no idea this had been sent that you two had had this conversation. Turns out she was actually like sick. And so she ended up not going to basketball. But this was um, uh, we're going to have a tough time when she's I know a if this is like kid stuff, what's it eight years be? old and she's already impersonating us to each other and doing it. I mean, well enough pretty to fool well. you, which yeah, it's a low bar because you're not that observant. I wasn't not paying one of your close strengths. attention. So anyway, that was our case of identity theft. Yeah, um, I'm a little so, concerned. Yeah, We're going to have know. to like put alarms on all the doors and windows. <laughs> Just, I, don't I don't know. No, what we're gonna do? I mean, she's at least she's she's quite smart, and so hopefully smart. Hopefully, enough not she to will get use her powers trouble. for good and not evil. But you know, TBD. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, if we're gonna get if we're gonna be subjected to identity theft, I'd rather be that way yeah, than any other sure. way. So anyway. Today's episode is brought to you by the Nuance Dragon Ambient Experience, or DAX for short. This is AI-powered ambient technology that helps the physician be more efficient and reduce clinical documentation burden. It's great. To learn more about how DAX Copilot can help reduce burnout and restore the joy of practicing medicine, stick around after the episode or visit nuance.com slash discover DAX. That's N-U-A-N-C-E dot com slash discover D-A-X. All right. We always start off with some healthcare news. That's right. All right. So what's going on in healthcare? Well, uh, match day. Mm, big, now, it was, big day. It was a few weeks ago and mm -hmm. we've talked about it a little bit on our other episodes and right. stuff. Uh, but uh, some of the statistics are out. People are talking about it. All right. Um, I, I do want to shout out Brian Carmody mm. on on. He's got a blog, Sheriff of Sodium, but he's uh, got a, a big following on Twitter X. And um, and he talks all about USMLE. Uh, step one, step two, uh, trends in the match. Mm -hmm. And it, like, really, like he is like the authority. It was very interesting uh, niche to like find yourself in. Uh, but he, so he's where I go whenever I want to hear someone like evaluate the match. We actually need to get him on the podcast. To talk yeah. About it because it, it really is. It's kind of fascinating look at this very important process in medicine, right? Because these are, this is how, it shapes the future of medicine. Like right. where are students going what into? What kinds of doctors, kind of doctors are we producing in are we, this country? Are we making? So anyway, uh, some of the big things uh, with the match. Every year, it seems like there is one specialty that really gets hit hard with unmatched hmm. applicants. But so, it's a different one every year? Yeah, well, it seems to be the case. So last year, it was emergency medicine. Okay. There were uh, They had the largest increase in unmatched applicants so that means that residency programs yeah are not filling all of their spots right and there was there were a lot of unfilled spots which is a big deal right mm -hmm. not only for the future of your specialty but also just for being able to do the work of right. the hospital right you need <laughs> you need cheap labor mm -hmm. <laughs> and and residents are surely cheap labor but um uh, so last year it was emergency medicine and people attributed that to just the pandemic like they you know, emergency out. medicine was hit hard. There was a lot of lack of respect toward emergency medicine. So it's just like it really cooled off in terms of students wanting to do emergency medicine. Yeah. This year, can you guess what specialty it was? Um, well, is there when it, when it happens every year, is it random or is it like there usually is a reason? You know, I, I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that question. I'll just tell you because you have no context I have no idea. for why, what nope. this would be. <laughs> uh, pediatrics. Oh. Yeah, pediatrics uh, had the biggest increase in unfilled positions. Okay, so let me ask you: If it's unfilled because 
people are ranking programs and programs are ranking individuals and there are enough individuals to fill all of the spots, but the the no. matching is just not happening or is it just there are not enough residents applying? I think I think it's the, the there's not enough not enough people are applying. Okay. Yeah. And maybe it's a combination of both, but I think it's just fewer applications, fewer pe- students deciding to go into pediatrics. And, okay. And you can, there's all, you know, people have all kinds of, can have all kinds of theories about why this is. Um, I think it, it ultimately comes down to money, right? As mm. most things do. Because all the highest paid specialties, they always fill. Right. Right. So all your surgical subspecialties, everything that's, that's procedure based typically fills. hmm and then because they're they're I mean, those are the higher paying specialties. They right. get reimbursed higher. And then the the other end, this year you have pediatrics which had the biggest spike in unfilled positions, but mm-hmm. family medicine's always down there at the bottom. Mm-hmm. Uh, internal medicine is always kind of down there at the bottom as well. So there's been a lot of discussion on social media about like well, what's going on. Like right. I'm sure pediatrics, the whole field is probably like, oh my God, this is a terrible thing. Um I think it, it all really comes down to like reimbursement. Mm. And it, it actually made me think of the the conversation we had with um, Katie Porter mm-hmm. about uh, what people lobby for. Right. Right. Yeah. It's so higher, yeah. higher paid like surgeons and stuff tend to lobby for reimbursement. Increased reimbursement. And then pediatrics, family medicine, and they lobby for things like, you know, like gun violence exactly, issues. And- exactly. And. And so I, you know, I think the the advocacy thing like that mm-hmm. may be a small part of it, but ultimately our healthcare system just values procedures over anything else. Well, it's a profit based right. system, and so and those are more expensive, right? And so, so and, and and you know, people can talk about you know their motivations all they want, but like money is going to be a motivation, right? You know especially with how much debt all these students are yeah. uh, are right are the cost of with. education is going up so uh, i i don't know how you how you fix that that's like way above my pay grade I'm trying to figure that out but yeah. um economics has got to be a, a a part of it and so i have a couple stats for you regarding reimbursement okay all right so adjusted for inflation physician reimbursement has declined 26% since 2001 mm. all right even though like cost of everything's going up since right. 2001, just for inflation, 26% decrease in physician reimbursement. That's across the board. Okay. Hospital reimbursement mm-hmm. has increased 70%. Okay. So explain to me the difference between those two things, because, you know, a lay person like myself, that yep. all just gets lumped into the city. You, you work at the yep. hospital. So, well, so well, you don't. Right. <laughs> so thank, thank God for that. <laughs> um, as an uh, ophthalmologist, we're... <laughs> We have a type one hypersensitivity reaction to hospitals. So, um, so you can, whenever you bill insurance for the stuff you do, mm-hmm. all right, there's always like physician fees. Yeah. Right, so that's, that's paid to the, the person providing the health care. So physicians. So I do a cataract surgery. So we don't, when we pay for a doctor's visit, we are not paying the doctor. We are paying the hospital. So, so there's two parts to it. Okay. All right. When you bill, there's, there's, there's physician fees and there's also facility fees. Okay. So you are paying part of the bill, the overall bill that you get from a hospital. There's going to be physician fees mm-hmm. that where that money will go to the physician and there's right. going to be facility fees, which go to the hospital. But like the bill is coming from the hospital. They're the one yeah, because, doing the... Right. They, well, what happens is they, they it goes to insurance and insurance will pay something. Right. But yeah, the bill... The bill that I get in the mail The bill comes directly says, from a, a hospital, yes, right. or a, a, a practice or so whatever. So the hospital is the one that is having to like work yeah, they get the with money the and insurance then, company, with right. the patient, with, you know, they're yeah, the doing hospital, they're the in-between for all the billing. Yeah, hospital will get all the money and then, but some of that will go to the... To different to, places. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, so basically... The way our healthcare system is set up is the physicians, their our reimbursement is going way down year after year, going mm-hmm. down. I mean, sometimes it goes up, but but when you adjust for inflation, it's going down basically. Right. But that's the opposite for the hospitals, and that's right. that's so like the hospitals are keeping more money. Yeah. Physicians are getting less money. And so what you uh, so uh, obviously what you have now is less fewer physicians are 
staying in private practice and they're just going to hospitals because that's mm -hmm. where all the money's going. So that is, so it gets to be this huge problem, especially I would say in like rural communities or really anywhere, it's just becoming harder to have an independent physician owned practice. Right. So these small private practices are going away because they just, they can't keep up with the costs and the decreasing reimbursement and everything's moving to hospitals. Where's the reimbursement coming from? Government? Um, like physician so, reimbursement. So Where does that come it's, from? It's CMA. It's Medicare. That's okay. the biggest, the biggest thing. I mean, there's always you always have the the private, private um, insurance companies, but most of the billing is to Medicare, and so it's the government that's setting, that's deciding. Okay, this year we're going to slash reimbursements three percent for these services. Mm -hmm. So, so we're talking mainly Medicare here. So anyway. Okay. Uh, so you are incentivized as a physician to go work at a hospital because they are keeping more of the reimbursements and so they can pay yeah, more just, to you than yeah, you can just, if you're in exact, private practice? Well, yeah, it, exactly. It just, it's, it's, your costs are going up in private practice and because your reimbursement is going down yeah. compared to hospitals, right. it's making it harder so to keep your hospitals, practice open. So at the they can counteract... Yeah, I mean, this is, yeah, you could go be an employee at a hospital yeah. because most of the money is being, you know, is flowing there and reimbursements continue to increase for hospitals. So okay. it just, it just, and the big picture here is just like, you're lo we're losing small private practices and we're gaining more of these big hospital networks. Mm -hmm. And that's not that really a great thing, I think. Mm -hmm. So, because we need small we need independent owned practice especially in like rural communities and little outside right. the big urban centers we need people out there practicing medicine but that's becoming harder and harder to do so mm -hmm. and the um and going back to the to the advocating thing yeah like you know that this is why you see so many physician groups advocating for increasing reimbursement mm -hmm. um but ultimately it's going to require, I think, a change in just where we value care, right? So value-based care, yeah, I, I don't know the best way to do it, but um, there's just so much emphasis on like procedure-oriented things that's mm -hmm. driving reimbursement compared to what primary care physicians do more of and right. just, you know, kind of the backbone of medicine type of stuff. So yeah. anyway, I don't know. So it, it's, it's difficult for pediatri pediatrics this year. We'll see who it is next year. Yeah. I don't know. Um, these segments always make me very depressed. <laughs> it's a good news. way to start these episodes, yeah. isn't it? Hooray. All right. So so here's the question I have that okay. I've thought about. Like, so what would I personally lobby for? So mm -hmm. we're talking about what you advocate for. Okay. So if, if I was a lobbyist. As an ophthalmologist? As an ophthalmologist for okay. ophthalmology. All right. So, but we're, I'm not, but I can't do like reimbursement or anything. Because obviously what I would lobby for is like, you know, tearing down the insurance companies well yeah you as a person but i have some very yeah. ophthalmology specific things that i would do okay all right here we go mandatory minimum sentencing for contact lens abusers <laughs> what do you think about that <laughs> uh i think i probably would have done some time if you had your way absolutely you would like i'm pretty good about it have... i'm pretty good i occasionally Here's I what Kristen does and sleep in when them. she, and it's not it's just very that you, occasional. and it's not just that you sleep in your contacts. This is what you do. You come up to me and be like, hey, Will, I slept in my contacts last night. You taunt me. Yeah. Cause I know it bothers you. You taunt me about it. Yep. You know that if I knew that you, I'm going to start checking your contact lens case. I don't have one because oh, I wear dailies. dailies. That's yeah. right. See, I'm pretty good. But I change them every day. Okay. Most of the time I take them out. <laughs> it's really just if I fall asleep unexpectedly that I end up sleeping in them. Anyway, I just think Congress should maybe pass a law that allows us to arrest people for not using contacts appropriately. Yeah, okay. That, that would seems solve reasonable. Things. Sure. All mm -hmm. right. Totally reasonable. Mm -hmm. Here's another one. If you get if you get metal in your eye from not wearing safety glasses while you're metal grinding or doing metal working, then you have to wear safety glasses for a week straight wherever you go. Everywhere. Everywhere. Grocery store, post office, uh, wherever else you go, you have to wear safety glasses. Okay. How about that? Do you have to sleep in them? Uh, uh, for a second offense, yes. A second offense, you have yeah. to sleep in them. Yeah, 24-7. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that will just make people hate wearing safety glasses? Safety goggles? All the more reason to wear them whenever you're metal grinding, so you don't have to wear them 24-7. Uh, <laughs> I'm just, look, 
I'm just I'm just telling people if you elect me as president of the United States, these are the types of things I could do executive actions. Executive, mm. yeah. I could I, I could just I think you might find some resistance to these ideas. I think by saying these things though, maybe that maybe I'm tanking my future uh political career. Oh, well career. then by all means, continue. Kristen really doesn't want me to I've been making a lot of jokes lately about running for office. No. No. So we had we had our we had a live show and I made a joke about it during the live show. Yeah. Thunderous applause. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. I think because it was a hilarious joke. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll still people, think about it. People could see what a ridiculous <laughs> idea that was and it amused and delighted them. Okay. Oh, well, let's take a so I have a little um activity for us to play. Okay. All right, so let's take a break first. We'll come back. Hey, Kristen. Yeah. AI tools are everywhere now. That is true. And they're here to stay. That's right. Well, have you heard about Precision? What, what is it? This is great. This is the first ever EHR integrated infectious disease AI platform. Ooh, that sounds useful. Infectious disease, it's a hard field. You yeah. got to figure out when to start antibiotics and, and try to, to decrease resistance and how long to keep the patient. It's, it's really tough. Yeah. Well, this is a, an AI tool that automatically highlights better antibiotic regimens. It empowers clinicians to save more lives while reducing their burnout. To see a demo, go to precision.com slash KKH. That's precision spelled with an X instead of an E. So P-R-X-C-I-S-I-O-N dot com slash KKH. Are right, you ready, Kristen? As ready as I can be. So we're going to do a segment, new segment called, Why Is It Like This? All right. There's a lot of weird things that happen in medicine. Very weird. Uh, from uh, medical training or just healthcare or just whatever. Yep. So it's a whole world. And you have a bit of an outsider's perspective on it. Yeah. Right? Like an inside outside. Yeah. 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 A little bit of both. Right? Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And so what I want you to do is choose a thing mm -hmm. and then ask, why is it like this? Okay. Why do you do the things you do? And I give you why a lot is of, it like this? Why not, is it not why are you like no, this? No, no. Oh well, uh, that that could be a different segment. <laughs> okay. Why? Why? We well, have. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever we're really like, why are you like this? Why do you do this thing? I got a lot of those. Actually, that's a good. That's a good segment. Let's let's save that yeah. one. All right. <laughs> I gave you a lot of prep time for this. Yeah, a whole like hour and a half. <laughs> Told you this morning so... we were doing this. So, um, so yeah, let's do it. Why is it like this? Okay. What do you got for me? Um, why is it like this? Why do in your healthcare training, mm -hmm. why do you have to do away rotations? Why does that bother you? Because it's really annoying and disruptive. Okay. In what way? Give people some context. Okay. Because, okay. Usually, now there's non-traditional students, of course, but typically, the, the majority of students are like in their late 20s, early 30s when, when they're in residency mm -hmm. in med school. Maybe early 20s if you're talking med school. But anyway, it's the, it's the time of life where young adults tend to, you know, partner up, maybe start a family, mm -hmm. right? You've got a lot of important things going on outside of your career at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes it, very difficult on the family members, the people who live with you, the people who are trying to uh, do life with you when you just up and disappear for six weeks <laughs> across the country sometimes um, or even just, you know, to a different town that now you can't, you know, live at home. You have to go live, live in that other town during the week and commute on the weekends, things like that. It's, it's, it makes it very difficult for the other people involved. Yes. Okay. When you have to just go away. So, yeah, so this was a, so this was a bigger, a big problem, uh, both in med school and residency for us. Yes, because so we had a med school baby. So med school, we had a uh, residency baby. So med school, we were at Dartmouth, mm -hmm. and Dartmouth in the is middle a, of New Hampshire. It's a very, it's a very small community, and so what they would do is for different rotations, for like OBGYN, for pediatric, like for inpatient pediatrics, I went three hours away to Portland, Maine, mm -hmm. for um, 
We had to go to Nashua for, for something. For OBGYN, I went like an hour south to Nashua. Uh, some people went, I mean, I, I chose to do a San Francisco rotation as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, you so, did. But you made of, that choice. <laughs> but some, a lot of them aren't, aren't like choices you can make. Right. So they, they like, you're going down there. That's the only place. So, and just in general, medicine, not even just away yeah. rotations, but medicine is very, you have to move around a lot and it, right. and, and it takes people away from their support systems, from their social networks, from, you know, just like right. rips your roots up and you have to keep reestablishing roots in all these different places. I mean, match day is a good example, right? Everybody just found out where they're going to move to. And that's part of the, the like big emotions of match day is, is you've you have to move. So, the, so the why is it like this? <laughs> so the reason, I mean, the mat, well, that's a whole other thing, but the reason that like you have to do these rotations in different areas is just because to get accredited as a med school in a, or a residency program, you have to be able to show that you can provide an, a, a specific threshold of educational experience. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a small enough community, sometimes you can't do that at that location. And so the, so Dartmouth is like, okay, hey, licensing body for the LCME. And that's what this was. They mm -hmm. say, okay, look, we can do OBGYN because we're, we're, we send patients to <laughs> Nashua, New Hampshire, or we send them up to Portland, Maine, or up to Burlington, Vermont, or not there because they have their own med school up there. But, uh, um, you know, all these places to, to give the students experience. Right. And so it's, it's out of necessity for like being just having enough clinical opportunities to accommodate all the med students. Why not just have your own clinics? If you're going to have a med school, well, they why do. not be sure that you have enough of those rotations? Like at the place? At the place. Because um, it's, there's just not enough in, at the place. It's a, it's a, it, there's, a, there's more med students than they can accommodate like in the OBGYN, the, the obstetrics, you know, clinic department, basically. I'm just saying, I feel like maybe we could focus on solving <laughs> that problem rather than just say, ah, we'll just ship them away. It's just, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's easier in place like Boston, right? Because if you're like living in Boston, you could do, there's like, there's right. multiple there's, hospitals, there's multiple hospitals, right? But if you go to places like, and by the way, who is it that sent us to Dartmouth in the first place? You know, <laughs> you didn't have to come. <laughs> so, so anyway, I, this is this is I think much more of an issue in a rural area. And right. then going to residency, mm -hmm. you know what 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 really was a a big wrench in in the in the gears of our residency experience mm. was that I had to do, I think it was ten weeks. I think it was ten weeks in Des Moines. So I did yeah. go two hours away to Des Moines, right. Monday through Thursday, and then I was home Friday through Sunday. Yes. And by the, Listener, at that let point, me tell you at that about point, our we had life. two kids. At that point, we had two kids okay. at that point. And we shared a car. We could only afford. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Well, it, actually, that car, it didn't have a car payment. So, yeah. like, we couldn't afford to just buy another car. Oh, what a car that, that was, time. too. That was oh. a piece of Joke. Don't do not besmirch the Honda. We element. don't need to get do into this right now. That could be a segment. Mm. Oh my goodness. Anyway, that car is the reason I had neck surgery. I stand by it. <laughs> anyway, we shared a car and we had two children. Yeah. And I had a career. Right. And I had to drive. And the children were in daycare because I had a career. And it is impossible if you have children in daycare or ever have recently. You know, it is impossible to find a daycare spot. So once you have one, you mm. hold on to it yeah. for dear life. And you do not give that spot away. I borrowed a car. Remember that? You From borrowed a, a car. And what else did we have to do to make this happen? My mom came. Yes. Your mother <laughs> had to come up. My mom lived with me from in Texas and live with you in Des Moines. Okay, she for ten weeks. She didn't have okay that she didn't have to do that. The backstory to that is I had just diagnosed with testicular cancer and had surgery, and so um, she was was feeling so there she was all of to this support like me and you and, need right yeah and, and so then she, you're having to move away right yeah. at that time and then your program did something that is is better than most programs 
which is um, they provided an apartment yes, in did. Des Moines for um, you to live in, for the residents to live in, which I think some programs do that. But they made sure that it was an apartment that had, I think, two bedrooms or something. Mm -hmm. Like the idea was we understand that some of you have families. And so no problem. We'll just make it so your family can go with you and live with you in this apartment. Yeah. And that was like the Band-Aid, the solution to this problem. Isn't that easy? Which for some uh, people... Uproot upper your life and, I suppose and just move. I suppose that worked. <laughs> but I feel like there's a lot of old-fashioned assumptions built into that of like, yes. okay, so I'm not working. I can just yeah. move somewhere for 10 weeks. Um, we couldn't take our kids out of daycare for 10 weeks. We would lose our spot for when we came back. Yeah. So, yeah, we just had to live apart for 10 weeks. It was. And then your mom had to rough. come help take care of you, the cancer survivor. And <laughs> I had to hold it down with two little babies all by myself and a, a job of my own, a full time job of my own. So and let me tell you, that drive to Des Moines. Whew, <sighs> it's rough. That was brutal. It was bad. You saw the the apartment was nice. My mom almost burned it down with candles. Yeah, well. That's true. But anyway. You can't um, leave her unsupervised. So, but that's the reason. And, you know, there just weren't enough farmers for us to take care of in Iowa. We had to. I guess. It, oh. That, so I, we, the rotation was at the Des Moines VA. And yes. so we got, it was, that was a. What almost, rotation were you doing? It was just comprehensive ophthalmology. I was just taking oh, care. Okay. Of, I was, that was a, really a different the first, population was the argument. Yeah. Well, it, it's a way for us to get a lot of surgical volume as residents. Yeah. And so we did a lot of surgery and it was a, it was, it's like the first time you really get to feel independent. As oh, a right. Cause it was at a VA. It was at a VA. The rules are different. But, okay. Well, that's a, that's a Pandora's <laughs> box you're opening here. Like that's, that's something to discuss at some point <laughs> is, is just the scope uh, of practice. No, no scope of practice, but um, it just the, ethics of residency training mm -hmm. and you know the fact that you're you're learning um under supervision right you know and so it's is it's, it's just a very interesting very nuanced discussion that i don't think we're prepared to have no right we're not now. doing that right now no <laughs> so, <laughs> not gonna open that can of worms um all right so i'm that's just why saying it's like i that. think that's why i think like that. <laughs> i don't think that's i'm not satisfied with that reason and I understand it, right? There yeah. is this need to see more patients, more specialties, whatever. Uh, however, let's come up with some better solutions, it, please. It just, it does add to the stress, the overall stress. And yeah. And, and it's just a, one of many ways that the, the whole life of med students, residents, what have you, are not, it, it's not considered, right? Like, I think it contributes to mental health issues, contributes to burnout. Like, yes, mm -hmm. maybe you get more hours in, you, you see more patients or whatever, but at what cost? And I think that the cost is is high, especially for for those people who are not just single people who can just get up and go wherever they want, whenever they want. Well, I want to I want to hear from people. I want to hear uh, what did you have a for the physicians in the audience? Uh, what kind of rotations or anybody who went through a medical you know training program? What um what kind of hardships did you have where was the farthest you ever had to go for a rotation and what kind of effect did it have on your family um and even single people like you still have family members right like you still have a support network right, a social exactly. network so yeah exactly. even those people have to so yeah. anyway tell us about it it's like Give the us only your rants. that's the only minor gripe we have about iowa in, in general like we loved it there but that was they did have a, they had a zombie burger in des moines, in yeah. des moines. well you got to go to des moines <laughs> <laughs> Don't you tell me about all the great things while you were gone and your mommy was taking care of you and you had no responsibilities other than yourself getting she, to work. She did cook for me. She did. I am sure she did your laundry. She, yeah, she did. Yes. <laughs> Meanwhile, what I, was okay. I doing? Okay. What was okay. I doing? All right. I all right. Ask you. And it wasn't. I, I will say it wasn't like I, it wasn't my idea. Like she came up. I didn't have, tell her to do that. She wanted to do that because she, you know, like you'd probably want to do that for your child too. Right. If, if they had some, maybe not the second one. <laughs> <laughs> no, which, which child? You know what she would do? She'd be like, uh, Hey, hi, Will. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I was going to go. Here's the deal. <laughs> Here's the deal. I can't find my I got phone. a little cancer. My car, um, my car doesn't work. Can you go to wherever our daughter is and and take care of her for ten weeks? Yeah, you I, would do it. And I'd buy it hook. If line you were and retired, 
Yeah, absolutely. I would. Yeah. I don't know if I would. I, I mean, I would certainly help. That's a big. It's a big task. Big thing to do, though. Yep. I don't know. Right now, that's hard to imagine because life is so crazy and busy and stressful and I'm already yep. like burned out. Yep. So but maybe, you know, okay, so when I'm retired. So here's the lesson for for residency program directors. Uh, make those if you have to because you're going to have to it just has to happen and at some places you're going to have to have away rotations different places just really really make it as easy as possible on the patient the patient <laughs> on the resident <laughs> and their families and I just and like to, just don't forget that they have families <laughs> it, right right like point it out like talk about it and and you know give some support there and like right. recognize hey i know this but this is really hard for you this is what we're doing to help make it a little easier right yeah. i think that's 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 the solution there sure there we go One we that did Kristen's it we solved not, it we're not real happy with but you know you do what you got to <laughs> do all right so um the last thing i want to talk about is uh, april april is testicular and young adult cancer month yes that Sure is. And that's a thing we know a thing or two about. Just a little bit. Can I give you some statistics? No, about both of those statistics? things. That's right. So cancer statistics for adolescent and young adult cancers. So mm -hmm. AYA cancers. Yes. Uh, this was from in um, the data from 2020. So first of all, AYA is anybody between the ages of 15 and 39 years old. So that's that's the designation for AYA. Okay. Whenever you're Whenever you turn 40, you're officially an adult. Hey. <laughs> or, or an, older, an old adult. An older adult. You're an old adult <laughs> at 40. Not a young adult. You're an old adult. Oh, boy. Um, about 80,000 young adults between 20 and 39 are diagnosed with cancer each year in the United States. 5% of all cancers are diagnosed in people in this age range. All right. So 5%. About 9,000 young adults die from cancer each year. Cancer is the fourth leading cause of death in this age group behind only accidents, suicide, and homicide. Mm. So it's a big deal. It's the leading cause of death from disease among uh, women in this age group and is second only to heart disease among men. Mm. So, so heart disease... Just to give you a scope of the issue. Right. Yeah. So, um, so cancer is the leading biological thing that right. can cause death in this age group. Right. And so the, what, I wanted, what I thought I'd do is just talk a little bit. One thing I've, because I've talked a lot about my cancer and the mm -hmm. ministry and everything. I thought I could talk about, and you could also chime in on your experience mm. of uh, my testosterone replacement journey. Because mm -hmm. it has been a, it has been a mm. wild ride. Yeah. So yes. after I had my first orchiectomy, mm -hmm. I was told by um, the, my urologist that I'd be fine in terms of my hormone levels. Right. Testosterone. Like, I was like, do I need to be on testosterone replacement? Right. So it's and, like, well, now I, you know, half, like, of, half of the mechanism is gone. So it they, seems like that should be a problem. And he was like, no, no, you don't need that. Right. In fact, I, I really never got my levels checked because of that. Like, it, it just. Well, that and you never go get. I did. Back checked. then, I, I went regularly to my <laughs> oncologist. But the, I mean, even my oncologist never yeah, checked. They it. said you didn't need to. And, and so I, for like about four years. Mm -hmm. I just attributed my like fatigue and yeah. crankiness mm -hmm. to just being in medicine. Right. But I don't think that was the whole story. No. That was part of it. Part of me is like part of my yeah. genetics is that way, but also <laughs> right. the cranky <laughs> the in particular. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, every med student is tired and sometimes yeah. cranky because it's a hard, stressful time of life. But I think I also, in looking back, had low testosterone and that was confirmed right before I had my second orchiectomy for cancer, mm -hmm. when they did check my testosterone level, and it was very low. No. It was, <laughs> it was <laughs> Didn't know we much lower than it should have been at the age of 30, 30 whenever I had the second, second one. Mm -hmm. So, and, like, and I was like, damn, like I could have, I could have been, been like, feeling better all this time. I, yeah, and plus I could have been like hulking out, like really oh. big mu muscles. <laughs> Like I, I could have really been, you know. I mean, you've got a, you've got a, could have been juicing. some biological, genetic constraints about how successful that would have been. But sure. Oh, because I'm super tall and skinny. Name one person in your family that's hulked out like that. My brother's You guys are just strong. not that body type. He's strong, yes, but okay, I guess you're right. Yeah. All right, but anyway, I think you know you had some delusions of grandeur about what could have happened. 
Well, also doesn't help that I went into ophthalmology, which is a notably <laughs> very weak specialty. Your fingers are quite strong. We are the weakest out of all the specialties, actually. <laughs> us, us in pathology. Proven. We're yeah. very actually no. They do some heavy lifting, I think. Mm. At some they're, point, they're telescopes. Wave. They're telescopes. They're Telescopes, Tele not telescopes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so used to our daughter. How far away are your are your Their body parts? Their microscopes are quite hefty. I imagine like a 400 foot lane yes. with a telescope, looking at uh, a liver. I don't know. Microscopes. <laughs> yes, yeah, so the microscopes are hefty. Maybe radiology. Anyway, we're are very also weak. weak. And so after I got my uh, my 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 second orchiectomy, obviously at that point. Like we were planning on it. Like I had to be on testosterone yeah. replacement. And tell the people why. Because some people, I, I oh, didn't know. Because I had no testicles left. And testicles. Make testosterone. Yeah. The Latex cells. Shout out Latex cells. I still remember some stuff. You do. Good. Yeah. Uh, I think that's right. I hope, I hope that's not <laughs> That'd I hope be that's funny not if wrong. that wasn't right. Oh my God. And I, I just said telescopes and you just said that. We yeah, we're, we're, we're trying here, we're, folks. We used to be smart. So, uh, so I had to be on testosterone replacement. And. And I had really good insurance at Iowa. This mm -hmm. is like that I had that good hospital insurance, mm -hmm. that good resident insurance. And so um I got on the gel. That was the first one. Yep. The and it's like Andra gel. I don't know, just it's a gel gel packets. Yeah. I hated it. I hated it. It was your body laughed in the face. Every the gel day packets. I had to rub the stuff on me and I couldn't. Touch. You had to be careful what you touch. And we had, we had three uh, females, three three women in the house, and so I had to had to, you know, stay away from them for right. uh, I don't know and twenty our, minutes. Our daughters were very small at that point, and so how you know how do you explain to a one year old that you can't go up and oh, hug your daddy? That was the daddy, worst part. Like you know? I couldn't. They, they would come up to try to hug me, and, and you'd have to be like, no. So it was. And they it don't was, understand. And this is every every day. I yeah. was putting this stuff on. And so I, I did that for like three months and was like, I, there's no way I can't it do this anymore. It didn't do anything either. Well, like I it, mean, it, very little. Yeah, it helped in that I wasn't getting hot flashes. So yeah. I had some testosterone in my body. But <laughs> 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 um, and so I moved to the injections. Yeah. And the injections were, booty. were great uh, for a while because they were super cheap. That's like the cheapest options, like once a week. Mm -hmm. But you get swings. Yeah. Swing like right. I'd feel, feel really good. I'd feel beginning. really good for a couple of days, and then it would go down. Yep, I got to where I would dread. The end I of think the week. you did it on Sundays because yeah. you wanted to be like Sunday evenings or something. You wanted to be feeling good for the work week, but and then, then it made feeling, our weekends miserable. <laughs> I was feeling real bad for for Gosh, family time you were on the weekend. So cranky and yeah. just difficult to be around when when you're like that because. You need that. Like I was surprised at all the things that testosterone yeah. does, you know, yeah. and it is a very potent. Uh, I don't know. It affects your mood a lot. Yeah, and this, and that's the problem with with those injectable ones because uh, it it was it, it's been around forever. Like it's just literally just putting testosterone in your ass muscle, and uh, and it, there's a wild swing. So it's just peaks and valleys. That's what you get. Yeah. So, but I was doing. I did that for God. Four year, four or five years. Yeah, a long time. Yeah, a long time. And and our understanding was that that was that well, those were our choices. I never had those two I, things. I I didn't see a urologist. I was seeing an endocrinologist for a while and an oncologist, and no one ever thought, hey, maybe we should send him back to an, a urologist to talk about this stuff. Mm -hmm. So, well, and let's be honest, doctors are not very good patients, so you were not always. Yeah, I, I didn't look up into and it. I didn't doing look things into it. as much as you should have. But but that's also like I mean, you wouldn't expect a your average patient to be like, let me research right. all the different things. Like, like you want a doctor to be able to to, to you assume that they know and that. they would tell you if. But there no was one something. ever mentioned like, like what are the different options for testosterone? Yeah. You know, so mm -hmm. so anyway, it wasn't until I had a, a we were a at keynote. a conference. Yep. I was at, I was doing a, a keynote presentation with Kristen. We were together at a urology conference. And I just like asked about it. They're like, oh, you're, they were like, they were shocked. You're like, you're doing, you're doing those injections mm -hmm. every week. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like there's, there's so many better things. And so now I'm doing this thing called Testapel. Yep. Which is Pellet. I go, I go every three to four months and I get a whole bunch of pellets <laughs> uh, it loaded up into my ass. Looks horrible. Like yeah, I, I went with you to one appointment and I couldn't look 
but from the little things I could yeah. see by accident every once in a while, it was like this this hollow steel tube. <laughs> and then there was a lot of blood. And I uh, deduced that I guess that's how that's the delivery method is the tube the, the by which the pellets get in there. The funniest part about those those uh, appointments is that like my when, when the urologist comes in, she like when she comes in, I'm like ass up, mm-hmm. bare ass, sunny side up. And I'm like, hey, how's it going? Yeah. <laughs> how's your week been? It's <laughs> just just <laughs> casual conversation with my ass in the air. So mm-hmm. um, that's fun. <laughs> but it's much better. And what I've also yeah. learned from urologists, because I spoke to, at another urology conference, uh, I guess the urologist really liked me. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, this it's a ball thing, you know? I guess. Um, the, what they told me was that like s- urologists, it's very rare to have what I had. Yes, you have two separate cancers realize, in each testicle yeah. and you have them removed. I right. thought it was like a 1% of people that get it in one testicle get in the other one. But apparently like a couple of urologists, like we, I've been practicing for 30 years and I have only seen one patient like you. Right. Well, I mean, that might be 1%, so, right? That might be how the numbers could be, shake but, out. But it's, it's, it's basically, it's very rare. And when you lose both testicles, it's extremely hard to get a normal testosterone level. Right. So all the protocols for how you treat testicular cancer most of them are assuming that there is one testicle still yeah. left and all the numbers, all the insurance, you know, whatever the insurance companies are going by, you basically just like don't fit the mold of what yeah. people are used to doing for this. And so it's been very difficult to get the right treatment for you because you're a special unicorn. I have maxed out the amount of pellets I can get. I've asked like yeah. the little things that they put in there. Mm-hmm. Like, I can't get any more. Like the, because insurance won't pay for more. No, they just or... won't. They can't fit more. Oh, like there's no space. <laughs> there's no space. But don't you have another butt cheek? I mean, I I could. I I don't know. It's, that seems. I don't know. Maybe I could do a second butt cheek, but I'm feeling yeah. okay. Like things yeah. are going. Okay. Things but I feel are going like better. it's still like it's much better than yeah. it was. But I feel like there's it's still like not quite where ideally you would be. Oh, and by the way. The health insurance trying to get them yeah, to pay for nightmare. any of this stuff. It was is a long, long process. You know how many times I had to prove to them, like I short of just going over there, pulling down my pants and being like, <laughs> look, feel for yourself. I have no testicles. <laughs> I think you could have been arrested for There's that. There's nothing here. It, it, please, hey, uh, you know, Cigna, <laughs> come over here. Just get in here. Take a feel. Take a good look. Look, I just, this it's empty sack. What more do you need There's to see? There's nothing there. Like, what, I don't make my own testosterone, <laughs> folks. I need this, and I need a lot of it. And you're a it. large person. Oh, it was, I, I. I, was, I almost I wanted to send my, you know, get like a CT scan just to show. Just, <laughs> please reference. Do you see testicles here? Like there's right. no, there's nothing here. There's nothing here. So anyway, I did not go over there and, and pull my pants down. Yeah, I would have been it would have been within my right to do it, though. <laughs> I mean, arguably, I, I would agree. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was just a, a disaster. Legally, maybe different. So but, so shout yeah, out. we've spent our young adulthood. Yeah. All of it. Yeah. Dealing with things like yeah. that. And and yeah. so do so many other people that are right know, experiencing adult adolescent young adult cancer. So this April, you know, if you, you have patients that are uh, that are dealing with this, you know, just you talk to them about it. And if you have patients that have had testicular cancer, maybe ask about those symptoms of low testosterone and see if Yeah, because you know, it, he's a physician. Talk about it. I've had quite a lot of, you know, like biology. Yeah. And even we didn't realize, oh, this is something we should be asking about. So, because exactly. it's just stuff that a lot of people experience normally, right? Just fatigue, yeah, irritability, tired. whatever. Exactly. But, uh, but yeah, should ask about it. And also, don't forget to consider how young adult cancer might be different from your patients who are who you are used to seeing, which are going to be older. Old adult people. cancer. Old adult cancer. Yeah, I can say that because this year I am one. I'm I'm aging out of this age bracket. That's on right. This, on my oh, next you're turning forty this year. How exciting! Oh, I know. <laughs> but that was another thing, right? Like yeah. you, you, uh, you might have different questions. Diff- the mm-hmm. cancer is going to affect your life in different ways than right. when you're, you know, because you got like little kids and a job and things that maybe your older patients don't have. So you know, consider those things also. All right, well, that's it. So April Testicular Cancer Month and. Uh, uh, adolescent and young adult cancer month. So, um, you know, just 
for those of you who are do your checks do your check oh yeah do your checks Just i feel, know that's controversial feel for around some reason. feel around those testicles no one knows your balls better than you do all right so feel them if you feel any like weird lumps or big swollen testicles or that feels different if it feels different because we all know kind of what they feel like feels different to you hey, go get checked out even Doesn't if it's hurt. tiny yours was tiny I was well, tiny, but I, I had a very clear little nodule. Yeah. It definitely felt like my testicle was trying to grow another testicle. So I went in and, you know, sure enough, cancer. So there you go. Well, let's take a quick break. We'll All come right. back with a fan story. Hey, Kristen. Yeah. Notice anything different about me? You look the same as always. Uh, I'm covered in mites. Uh, well, you don't have to tell everyone that. <laughs> Maybe you need a mite, too. What do you think? I I prefer to be mite free. You know what these things are? They're demodex. I know. They're ever, enormous. Have you ever had red, itchy, irritated eyelids? No, but that does sound very uncomfortable. It could be caused by one of these little guys. Mm. Now they're a lot smaller in real life. Well, that's comforting at right. least. But it's it's they're called demodex, mm -hmm. and it's uh, yeah, it can cause problems with the eyelids. They're the mites that live on your eyelashes. Mm, just chomping on all that goo. Now it might seem gross. But you don't want to get okay. grossed out by this. Okay. All right. You got to get checked out. That is right, very so just sensible. Go to, your eye, go to your eye doctor. Ask about demodex blepharitis. All right. That's really what you got to do. Or DB, mm. if you want to be a little shorthand with it. Yeah. Make to, it sound like you know what you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. To find out more, you can go to eyelidcheck.com. Again, that's E-Y-E-L-I-D-Check.com to find out more information about these little guys. Tell them Dr. Glockenfleck and sent you. That's right. Demodex blepharitis. <laughs> All right, let's look at a story. Uh, so, so this comes from a listener named Mike. So Mike says, um, Canada, uh, this is great because it's, Mike's given us, given me some like healthcare stuff to look into. Oh, here. yeah. So nice. Mike's from Canada. He says, so Canada doesn't have the whole PBM issue. So pharmacy mm -hmm. benefit managers. Um, but one company is trying real hard. So basically trying to like, just be take advantage of the system. Be a, yeah, you know, just tr try to uh, corporate corporatize the pharmacy system in Canada. Uh, it says they are called Shoppers Drug Mart, or SDM for short. So I'm going to have to look this up. SDM. So he says um, that my wife loves to, uh, that every time I pass the SDM in Canada, I give it the finger. Just doing your own little daily. Yeah, that's something that we should probably all do to like CVS. Mm. You know, just pass by, give a little, give a little, uh, you know, just stick it to them a little bit. Before you park in their parking lot and go in and get your prescription. <laughs> I, I do not use, I, I don't have a community pharmacy nearby. So unfortunately I, I'd have to use one of the chains, but I don't use CVS. Mm. They're, the CVS is like. Are they the worst? They're, they're, yeah. They're like no, noticeably. Huh? They're worse than every way. I mean, they got the long receipts. They got <laughs> the long receipts. Yeah, have you never seen the? No, the, I know what you're talking about. Why does that make them the worst? It, does, it doesn't. It's just one thing. <laughs> Seems that was not what I was expecting. Why do you say. need long receipts like that? I don't know. No, they're one of the the giants of the PBM giants. Yeah. They're like I think it's Aetna. They're yeah, CVS owns Aetna, and so okay. they're all about the. They have got um, one of the big PBMs. I think yeah. it's Express Scripts, I want to say. Anyway. Anyway, they're 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 in it. They're they're like the the American the shoppers drug. Okay. All right. I'm you know with what you. I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So anyway. Um so he says that he he makes sure to give the SDM in Canada the middle finger every time he passes by one. It also learned that one of um, my wife's colleagues steals one ten dollar item from them. Mm. Now ten dollars in Canada, he says. Uh, Mike says that's like seven cents in American money. <laughs> well, I think it's a little more so than that. Maybe, but yeah. maybe a little bit more, but um, uh, <laughs> steals one ten dollar item from them just out of pure frustration. Uh, but obviously, the lesson here: uh, we don't we do condone not. No. stealing from a. Far but right. you know, you it just gives you just a the sense frustration of how how angry people are yeah. about this shoppers drug mart. So I he's he's encouraging me, Mike, is to like look into it and try to make some content about right. it if possible. Yeah, yeah. I've never I've never gone into all in on the uh, the Canadian pharmacy situation. Yeah. I feel like I got enough to worry about on the U.S. side. Right. Maybe we need a, a research trip to Canada. Oh yeah, maybe so. Yeah, could uh could go uh, check out some 
Shoppers Drug Mart in in Canada. <laughs> I've never even heard of it. Yeah, I know. You should go. You should film okay. there. We should do, I don't know, someone give us a reason to come to Canada. Like someone, will someone cover our travel? I'll look into it, Mike. <laughs> Thanks for the recommendation. Uh, send us uh, any stories or, or content suggestions. Knock, knock, hi at human-content.com. Uh, and let us know what you thought of the episode. Let us know what you think about Glock Talk. What Glock, what, what Glock Talk topics do you want us to talk about? <laughs> let us know. Email us. You can visit us on our social media platforms or uh, hang out with us in the Human Content Podcast family on Instagram and TikTok at Human Content Pods. Thanks to all the great listeners leaving feedback and reviews. We love those. Uh, we can give you a shout out if you leave us a nice little review like at GRMP. E Queer on YouTube said, always good to see the Glock and Fleckens. Good people. Oh, thank well, you. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's very nice. Uh, full of video episodes are up every week on YouTube at D Glock and Flecken. Lots of cool perks on our Patreon. Mm-hmm. You got to check out the Patreon. It's mm-hmm. awesome. React to show and medical. Uh, react. Re, where, where we are you react okay? to are medical you shows and movies. Tell me if you're stroking out. Oh, I will help. No, I'm not. I'm not. Okay. I'm not. I don't think. Hang out with other members of the Knock Knock High community. We're there. We're active. And early ad-free episode access, interactive Q&A live stream events, upgrades on tickets to our live shows. Mm-hmm. That's another one. Uh, Patreon.com slash Glock and Flecken or go to Glock and Speaking of Patreon community perks, new member shout out to Vank Zosin. Oh, I love it. I love that name. Vank what Zosin. Is it? That's a, um, a couple of antibiotics. That's like, the, uh-huh. that's like the broad spectrum. It's like a joke that uh, I think I used in one of my infectious disease oh, skits. Oh, okay. It's always like, you always like Vanxosin. It's like the broad spectrum thing that I'm sure infectious disease doctors hate because it's like broad spectrum and right. can promote antibiotic like resistance lazy. Yeah, a little bit. That's yeah. like the connotation, right? So right. Vanxosin, thanks for being a member and thank you for that name. I love that. Uh, shout out to all the Jonathans as usual. Patrick Lucia C. Sharon S. Omar Edward K. Stephen G. Jonathan F. Marion W. Mr. Granddaddy. Caitlin C. Brianna L. K. L. Keith G. JJH, Derek and Mary H, Zana F, Jenny J, Muhammad K, Aviga Parker, Ryan, Muhammad L, David H, Jack K, Medical Meg, Bubbly Salt, and Pink Macho. A virtual head nod to you all. Patreon roulette, random shout out to someone on the emergency medicine tier. We got Eleanor F. Thank you, Eleanor, for being a patron on Patreon. I love our little growing community. I know. Isn't it great. Yeah. We got a role for everyone. All right, so just tell us what you want to do in our little town, and we'll make it happen. You know what we need is we need an intern. A a patron? A what? Yeah. Well, you like said we have intern? a role for everyone, and I could use an intern. Should we have a match? No, I process? don't. I don't mean a, a medical intern. I mean like a like a oh. business intern. <laughs> you want to? If you want to be a, a Lady Glock and Fleckens intern, you can apply. I guess. <laughs> I don't know. That's a new job we just decided now to have. <laughs> Thank you all for listening. We're your hosts, Will and Kristen Flannery, also known as the Glock of Fleckens. Our special, our executive producers are Will Flannery, Kristen Flannery, Aaron Corney, Rob Goldman, Shanti Brook, editor and engineer Jason Pertizer. Our music is by Omer Ben To learn about our Knock Knock Highs program disclaimer and ethics policy, what was that email we got? Did we get an email? Someone wants you to, to <laughs> should they want to learn about it. So, someone just sent an email. Oh, we got to find it. We got to, I, uh, I don't know who it was, but said, uh, um, we, <laughs> I would appreciate more information yeah. about the program disclaimer and ethics policy, please. <laughs> the licensing very, terms. Very serious about it. Yes. Submission verification, licensing terms, HIPAA release terms. You can hear all of those or see all of those. Not hear them. I'm not going to say uh, anything about them. You can go to glockandflecken.com to learn more or reach out to us. Knock, knock, at human-content.com with any questions, confer- concerns, or fun jokes. Knock Knock High is a human content production. God, what a struggle that was. My God. Sorry about that. I'll be better next time. Bye, everyone. Knock Knock. Goodbye. Hey, Kristen. Yeah. What do you think about my Dax co pilot? He's very cute. Almost as cute as mine. Oh, he's great. He just sits right there. I know. Can I tell you about Dax? Yeah, tell me. Oh, man. It's fantastic. The Dragon Ambient Experience from Nuance. Mm. And they call it Dax Copilot. That's cute. Yeah. He helps with documentation burden, uh-huh. reducing burnout. In fact, 80% of patients say their physician is more focused using the Dax Copilot. Mm. That's that's huge. That's pretty good. We all want to be able to connect more with our patients. Right. And all the documentation we have to do now, it makes it almost impossible. Yeah. Easy to burn out. Absolutely. That's your job. And 85% of patients say their physician is more personable and conversational. I like that. 
I want to, I, I need help being conversational you sometimes. You do. And Dax is one of those <laughs> things that can help you get there. So uh, to learn more about the Nuance Dragon Ambient Experience or Dax Copilot, visit nuance.com slash discover Dax. That's N-U-A-N-C-E dot com slash discover D-A-X. Thanks for watching the episode. You can find more on that playlist over there. If you prefer to listen or you just had your eyes dilated, you can binge full episodes wherever you get your podcasts or join the party over on Patreon where you get early access episodes, hang out with us, get lots of exclusive bonus content. Hope you subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think.